Hello, and welcome to this video on the honeybee brood pathogen Melissococcus plutonius, the causative agent of European fell brood. My name is Kirsty Stainton, and I work at Ferris Science Limited. This talk is made on behalf of the Animal and Plant Health Agency and DEFRA. European fell brood is a disease caused by the bacterium Melissococcus plutonius. It is a widespread brood disease in the UK, with approximately 300 reported cases per year. This disease is a statutory notifiable disease. This means that beekeepers are legally obliged to inform the National Bee Unit if they suspect it in any of their colonies under the Bee Diseases and Pest Control Orders of 2006. Honey bee brood becomes infected with EFB when it ingests bacteria from infected brood food. The bacteria cause an intestinal infection whereby the bacteria grow up inside the gut and kill the developing larvae. If infected with sufficient numbers of bacteria, the larvae will become visibly diseased and die at around four to five days old. The earlier stage larvae may become transparent when they die, while older larvae will become twisted in their cells and lose their clear segmentation pattern. We call this melting down, and it's quite descriptive of how the larva looks when it has died. The larvae may turn yellow and then brown as they decompose. Eventually, the dead larva will turn into dark rubbery scales. EFB infections can have a particularly sour odour, but this is not always present, so rely on a visual examination for your diagnosis. If we compare the diseased larvae to healthy larvae, the symptoms appear obvious. On the left hand side, we have an example of healthy brood. The larvae are sitting neatly in their cells in a C shape. They have a clear segmentation pattern and they're pearly white and the overall brood pattern is consistent. However, when the comb is infected with EFB, like the example image on the right, the brood pattern is inconsistent. Some of the larvae are not in a C shape. They have lost their segmentation pattern and they look as though they have melted. Some of the larvae have begun to turn yellow and brown. When the colony first becomes diseased, only a small number of larvae may be infected, so it might not be as obvious as the example shown in this picture. But if you learn to recognise these symptoms, you can increase your chances of detecting disease early on, which will improve your chances of successfully treating it, and it will reduce the chance that it will spread to other colonies. There are molecular methods for detecting the bacteria that cause EFB and researchers have used these methods to find out where the bacteria reside. The graph on the left is from a study by Ava Forsgren and her colleagues. It shows that the bacterium that cause EFB were detected in honey from colonies with clinical symptoms of EFB. They were also detected in colonies that had no signs of clinical EFB. On the right, we have a graph from Belloy and colleagues. In this study, researchers discovered that the closer that the honeybee colonies were to a diseased apiary, the more likely it was that the EFB was detectable in that colony. However, the colonies were not necessarily symptomatic. This study demonstrated that the bacterium could be present without causing symptoms. The EFB was detectable on the adult bees too, highlighting how bees can spread this bacterium between the colonies. It is worth noting that in this study, Colonies from EFB-free areas had no detectable EFB in them, so EFB is not necessarily everywhere and it can be prevented. Because adult bees can carry the bacteria, they can transmit the disease to other colonies through drifting or rubbing. As shown in the previous slide, EFB can be found in honey, so a hive can be infected through access to infected honey. Also, the bacteria can be transferred by us, the beekeepers, if we use infected equipment that has not been properly cleaned. You can keep your hive tools clean by giving them a wash in a solution of water mixed with washing soda. If a colony is infected with EFB, it should not be moved, and after working on this hive, beekeepers should clean their bee suits and any equipment that has been used. And if a colony is found to be infected with EFB, it can be treated in one of three ways depending on the time of year, the size of the colony and the severity of the infection. The treatment options available in the UK 
our antibiotic treatment with oxytetracycline, also known as OTC, a shug swarm or destruction. Generally, OTC isn't used very much anymore in the UK. We tend to use it at the end of the season in autumn, but during the season, the preference is to treat with a shook swarm or destruction. If the colony infected is large, and if the infection is affecting less than 50% of the brood, then National Bee Unit bee inspectors are likely to recommend a shook swarm as treatment, as this will get rid of the majority of the infected material. However, if the colony is small, or very heavily infected, then destruction is the only action left available. It is important to destroy heavily infected hives to prevent infection of neighbouring colonies and apiaries. The brood combs are burned and the hives themselves can be sterilised through scorching with a blowtorch. As you can see from the bar chart, how EFB has been treated in the UK has changed over time with OTC and destruction being used as a treatment from the mid-1990s until 2004 when Shook Swarm was introduced as a treatment. OTC is best avoided as there is resistance of EFB bacterium to OTC, as when it is used routinely, selection for resistant strains of the bacterium occurs. The treatments used against EFB in the UK has changed over the decades. In the 1950s, treatment for EFB was destruction of symptomatic colonies, and in the 1960s, OTC treatment of symptomatic and contact colonies was introduced. Between 1950 and the early 1980s, EFB prevalence was low, but it began to increase significantly in the late 1980s. This may be related to increased resistance of EFB to antibiotics. In the year 2000, EFB levels in England and Wales peaked at around 3.5%, but fortunately, since then, levels have been declining. Antimicrobial resistance is a serious problem, not just with honeybee disease, but with diseases in humans and livestock too. When an antibiotic is used to treat a bacterial infection, some very small number of bacteria may have some resistance to the treatment. If antibiotics are repeatedly used, then over time, the bacteria with the resistance genes have a significant advantage over the susceptible bacteria. They will be able to grow and proliferate even in the presence of the antibiotic and may be spread in the environment. As bacteria are able to share their resistance with other bacteria as well, through reproduction, resistance can arise and spread very quickly. Therefore, antibiotics should only be used as a last resort and not as a continual treatment. In the UK, there are some areas where EFB is particularly problematic and other areas where it is not present at all. Researchers sought to determine why there are regional differences in EFB and to explain increases in EFB in certain areas. It was found that there are differences in the DNA sequences of different strains of the bacterium that cause EFB. And this allows us to classify the different strains using a method called multi-locus sequence typing. This typing allows us to now classify strains of Melissococcus plutonius based on their sequence type, or ST. Other researchers across the world have developed similar methods, and so far, 35 different strains of EFB have been identified worldwide, while in the UK we can have up to 19 strain types. In the UK, NBU inspectors take a sample of every EFB case they find in England and Wales. They collect a disease larva, homogenise it in a stabilisation buffer and run a small aliquot of this liquid through a lateral flow device. This is a small device which uses antibodies to detect the bacteria and confirm that it is present. Once they have verified the condition, the buffer bottle and the lateral flow device are sent to the MBU laboratory. Here, the bacteria present in the buffer bottle will be analysed and the laboratory worker will be able to identify the strain type of the EFB that the bee inspector has found in the field. This process has been performed for all cases of EFB in England and Wales since 2014. Thanks to this genetic typing scheme, we now have a good idea of the strain types of Melissococcus plutonius that exist in the UK. 
If we look at the cases of EFB in England and Wales on this map, we can see the location for all the cases of EFB for a single year in red dots. Each dot represents an apiary where EFB was found. This becomes more interesting when we look at the map. On the right, which are the same cases of EFB, but each case has been given a different colour based on which strain type it is. By looking at this map, we begin to understand that some strain types of EFB have regional distributions, while other strain types tend to be more ubiquitous throughout England and Wales. Let's look at this in more detail. Here we can see the cases of EFB in England and Wales for 2014. If we look around the map, we can see that the light green dots, which represent strain type 3, are common throughout England and Wales, and it doesn't appear to cluster in any specific region. The orange dots represent strain type 5, and this strain type is found throughout England and Wales also, but is less common than type 3. If we look at the red dots, which represent strain type 22, we can see that this strain type is rare, but very localised to the Herefordshire region, and the pink dots, strain 13, are very localised to East Anglia. Similarly, down in the southwest, we have strain type 2, which is represented by dark green. This strain type is fairly localised to the southwest of England. We can also see in this map that there's less EFB in the north of England than in the south. In England and Wales in 2014, we observed 308 cases of EFB. That is to say, this is the number of hives from which an EFB sample was collected. It is often the case that multiple hives in an apiary are infected with EFB because the chances of contracting EFB increase with proximity to an infected hive. The cases found in this year were in 183 apiaries. In 2015, 325 cases of EFB were observed, affecting 154 apiaries. We can see something interesting happens in 2015 with strain type 3, represented by the light green dots. In the southeast of England and in the north of Wales, we have two separate outbreaks of this strain type. But as we can see, if we move to 2016, this strain type has responded well to treatment and the outbreak in Wales has been successfully dealt with, whilst the outbreak in the southeast has improved significantly. In 2016, there were 277 cases of EFB affecting 139 apiaries. This is lower than the previous two years, and a strain type has actually disappeared from England and Wales in 2016. Strain type 29, which was represented by a blue dot, which was present at very low levels in 2014 and 2015, was no longer found in 2016. And in 2017, there were 312 cases of EFB in 160 apiaries. And we have a different strain type outbreak this year of strain type 2. This strain is very persistent in the southwest of England, where they suffer from sporadic outbreaks of this strain of EFB. In 2018, there were fewer recorded cases of EFB than in recent years, with only 248 cases affecting 148 apiaries. In 2018, many different strain types of EFB were found in the Greater London area, which may reflect movement of bees or just an increase in the number of inspections in that area for that year. So as you can see, over many years, the National Bee Unit has collected a lot of data on the EFB strain types in the UK. But why is this data useful? It's useful to identify new incursions of strains. For example, if a new strain type appears in the UK, we may be able to identify its country of origin. We can also identify if we manage to eradicate strains. The information could also be used to understand the movement of EFB, especially in cases of rarer or local strain types, which might occasionally appear in a different part of the country and may be linked to a movement of diseased bees. It is also important to identify the movement of diseased bees it has the potential to assist with management. For example, we can identify if certain strain types are resistant to different treatment types. For example, if a strain reoccurs after treatment with antibiotic. And in fact, we have identified a strain type, ST5, which has very high levels of reoccurrence after treatment with the antibiotic OTC. 
Department, our understanding of these different strain types is still developing. At Fair Science Limited, there is research investigating the biological properties of these different strain types. Nicola Burns, a PhD student at York University who works with Fair Science Limited, has been sequencing entire genomes of different strains of EFB to better understand why the strains behave differently. She's also performing bioassays where she feeds different strains of EFB to developing honeybee larvae in the lab to see how the larvae develop. She's also studying which genes are being expressed by the strain types infecting these larvae to see if they behave differently. You should perform regular brood inspections and check for the symptoms of EFB as described in this video. If you suspect EFB, you should call your local bee inspector immediately. EFB is a statutory notifiable disease and must be dealt with quickly. As a precaution, when buying bees, take measures to ensure that they are from a disease-free source. And if you catch swarms, ensure that they are hived onto fresh foundation and kept isolated from your other bees until you're sure they're free from EFB and other diseases. Never buy old combs, and if you do inherit some second-hand equipment, then sterilise it with a blowtorch before you use it. This will kill any EFB present. In the case of polystyrene hives, these will need to be immersed in a 0.5% bleach solution for 20 minutes to kill any bacteria present. You can minimise transmission of pathogens between hives by arranging your hives facing in different directions. Bees are more likely to drift between colonies if all the hives are arranged in a line with entrances facing the same direction. And you can reduce this significantly if you don't keep your hives in a line and even have hives of different heights and different colours. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the National Bee Unit and the inspectors for their hard work managing EFB outbreaks in the UK and thanks to DEFRA and Welsh Government who fund EFB research. Thank you for listening to this video.